schedule for Holy Week, but it will include an a evening service on Monday, Thursday, a Good Friday service, and also um, three uh, services on Easter morning. So the, as we continue on in our, in our uh, series, Not a Fan, this week we are encouraged to ask the question, are you following the rules or are you following Jesus? Are you following the rules or are you following Jesus? Let's think about that question for a moment. Think about that uh, in regard to your own walk. What does your walk look like? Is it uh, following the light of Christ as the, as the song that we sang and talked about? Or is it just uh, following a list of, of do's and don'ts? Um, you know, if you grew up in the church, it's likely that your parents then had a list of things that you're supposed to do and not do as when you come to church, right? That, um, that you dress your best, right? You put on some nice clothes. That when you come to church, you sit still, and you don't make noise, and at this part of the service you stand up, and at this part of the service you sit down, and um, and so then uh, you know, and there's good reason for all these rules, right? That that we want to give God our best on Sunday morning. We want to right um, uh, be on our best behavior and uh, and learn what it means to to focus on God during worship. But the danger in this is that. It can instill in us a, uh, a an idea of following Jesus that it is a, a list of of do's and don'ts that um, that almost we have to kind of uh, put on a um, a costume of, of of appearing like that we have it all together or that um, we're uh, we're better than we really are for the sake of coming to church. But let me ask you this: If a child were to ask you, what does it mean to be a Christian? A little child were to ask you, what does it mean to be a Christian? How would you answer that? And uh, would you say, well, to be a Christian means that you uh, say your prayers before you go to bed and you uh, worship every Sunday. And when you go to worship, you wear uh, nice clothes and, and you're, uh, you know, you're quiet and, and still and, um, you know, you do what your, your parents tell you. Well, you know, being a Christian might include all those things, but that's not really at the core what being a Christian is, right? I would hope that we would answer that question by saying being a Christian is about having faith in Jesus. That we are forgiven, redeemed children of God because of his sacrifice on the cross, and we put our faith and trust in that. That is what being a Christian is about. But maybe even we have some of this residual uh, uh, you know, things from childhood in, in our mind, like we can hear our mom and dad's voice in our heads saying, uh, wear, you know, put on your best clothes for Sunday and, and be on your best behavior and put on a happy face and, and uh, show everybody that everything's fine and everything's good. And then, so in a way, when we, when we have those voices in our head, we, can, we tend to put on an act on Sunday morning to, to be someone that we're maybe not really Monday through Saturday, and uh, it's, it, might be that, um, it might be that we're trying to offer God our best, but it also might be that we just don't want other people to know what we're struggling with or how we're not really as righteous as we want to appear. So think about this then. Where does following the rules get you? Where does following the rules get you? Let's see, I should have a slide for that. There we go. Uh, one more. Where does following the rules get you? All right, think of that question. Now, uh, in our uh, Connections um, service, we do something maybe a little different that we throw out some discussion questions as part of the message to, to talk about and uh, to, to discuss. So we're going to do that now, and I want you to discuss this at your tables. Where does following the rules get you? And uh, just in general, in church, you can, you can talk about whatever you want in relation to the context of this question, but let's take about two minutes and discuss this now. Where does following the rules get you?
Let's take uh, just a few more seconds to uh, finish up our conversation on this one. Where does following the rules get you? Well, we, we talked about this at, at my table, and, and in some contexts, you know, it it's, gets you far, right? Um, if you're in school, right, you follow the rules, and uh, you do well in school, and, and um, you know, sometimes uh, not following the rules has, has consequences, right? But, um, you know, in relation to our, rela- in our uh, relationship with Jesus and our God, where does following the rules get you in that context? In, in following our God or following Jesus in our relationship with him, where does following the rules get you? Well, I think that, you know, as our faith, if it becomes about following the rules, then it will get you, I'll tell you first, well, it won't get you. Scripture's pretty clear about this. It won't get you to perfection. You know, the scripture says all have uh, um, sin and fallen short of the glory of God and uh, if you say you have no sin you deceive yourself and the truth is not in you so it won't get you to perfection following the rules um, it won't even get you to good because Jesus says in the gospel of Mark no one is good but God alone so following the rules won't get you to perfection and it won't get you to even good so where do you end up then if that is the focus of your relationship with God? Well, I think it's one of two places. If your faith is about following the rules, you end up in one of two places. One is despair. When you realize that uh, you have lots of faults and that you've fallen down in in many ways in, in following those rules, so despair is one. And two is hypocrisy. That uh, we want to pretend like that we have uh, all the rules covered and that we're righteous people, but we hide then the, the sin that's, that's in us and we're not honest about it. So following the rules as our focus of our faith then it leads either to despair or hypocrisy. Let me give you an example. You know, Martin Luther, the father of our church, um, the re- church reformer from the 1500s, he uh, had went through a period of his life where he was in a pretty deep despair. He joined the monastery, and he made it his goal to try and uh, be a perfect monk, to do his best at following the rules. But uh, what he found out was that um, he wasn't perfect and and wasn't even good, and so he would go to confession like three times a day. And he would fast, sometimes for more than three days at a time. And he would punish himself as penance for for the things that he did wrong. And um, one day he was uh, absent from worship and some of the monks went to his room to see if they could find him and they found him passed out on the floor because he was, he was fasting so much. And so the priest, one of the priests there thought, you know, it's not good for, for Martin to be uh, in so much despair and so focused on his own uh, shortcomings. So um, why don't we send him to Rome on a pilgrimage? Well, Martin Luther was very excited about this. He had a lot of hope then when he would go to Rome and he would finally find what he had been looking for, that, that perfection in the church, that, that place where the rules of God were being followed. And so him and another uh, monk decided they were going to go, and on the way they stayed in, in monasteries along the way. And, uh, and, and Martin Luther was really discouraged as he went because he found in those other monasteries three things. One that he felt like the monks were using the, the ties of the people of the church in, to live in extravagant ways. That was one thing that he found he was disappointed in. Also, he found that um, they had, in his opinion, uh, loose morals, the monks that he stayed with along the way. And uh, finally, he thought that they had a lack of interest in spiritual things. For being monks, they had a lack of interest in spiritual things. But he still had hope that when he got to Rome, things were going to be different, right? That uh, that was his hope, that in his despair, he was going to find that place where people were following God's rules and they were righteous. And so he ended up in Rome, and what he found was that Rome, in fact, was much worse than the monasteries that he had run into along the way. In fact, the priests there 
were uh, open with one another about their infidelities and they would live one way and then they would put on their fancy robes and everything and go lead worship and uh, lead God's people and pretend to be something else. And they were uh, living in extreme extravagance with little or no uh, desire for spiritual things, for prayer and fasting and, and being in, in the Bible. So, so he just went into a deeper despair. And uh, he quoted... Um, this, uh, this old um, uh, Italian saying that said, uh, if, if hell is a place, Rome is certainly built on it. And that's how in despair he was, that he went there seeking this perfection, this Jerusalem, this uh, heaven on earth, and what he found was what he considered to be pretty much close to hell as you can get. So he went back then even more in despair than in before. And because he no longer had this hope of Rome that he had when he left, he had to find another hope. And when he got back, he poured himself into the scriptures of God. In his despair, he went to the word of God. So when he went to Rome, he found hypocrisy because they uh, were pretending to follow the rules when they really weren't, but he himself was in despair. The two places that you end up when your faith becomes about following the rules— and you know, the, this was the same in Jesus' day. When he was there, he, he had a lot to say about the, the Pharisees. And they were actually keeping people out of the church because they weren't able to live perfect lives. He said, if you're sinning, if you're not perfect, then you can't go in the church. But their hypocrisy was that they were not able to keep the same standard that they were holding God's people to, and they were engaging in the same sins that they were keeping other people out of the church for. And so they were condemning others and pretending to be righteous themselves. These were the Pharisees. They put rules above people and above God. They put rules above people and above God. You know, um, following the rules then, you know, we talked, we sang about what it means that Jesus is the light, our lighthouse. Following the rules really will leave somebody in darkness. Because whether or not you're, you're faking it or whether you're in despair, you're still in darkness. The darkness of despair says that I have no hope, no light around me, nothing to go towards that's going to, to bring me peace. And to be, uh, a, a, to be a fake, to pretend like you're righteous when you're really hiding the fact that you're not, means that you're in the darkness because you don't want people to see how you really are. So that is the definition of darkness, either in despair or hypocrisy. And so... Um, Jesus has something to say about that. I just want to read to you from the Gospel of Matthew. In, the, in, verse, or in chapter 23, rather, uh, Jesus has a number of woes. Woe to you for uh, the, the Pharisees for this and for those who do this. And, and I just want to read you one section of that, though. That's verse 27 and 28. Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. I have a, a picture here that I want to show you. This is uh, Jesus' picture that he paints here. He says, woe to the fakes, basically. And he, in an illustration of that, he says, those people who, uh, who are uh, sinners on the inside, and instead of repenting and being honest about their sin, they put on a good front and they pretend to be righteous. Well, those people are like whitewashed tombs. You can imagine a tomb that is uh, as, as white, uh, as clean, and as uh, you know, ornate on the outside, but what's on the inside, right? Everybody knows what's on the inside. There's dead bones and everything unclean, as Jesus puts it. And this is what we become when a church puts rules above people and above God. You know, my brother um, uh, Max uh, told me a story. He said that I could share this with you. And I've said before how uh, he kind of struggles with his faith and, and believing in Jesus. And, um, and so he was telling me uh, a story about um, this church where his kids go to school. When uh, my, they moved out to, my brother and his wife moved out to California, the schools weren't uh, as good as they wanted them to be, the public schools, so they put their kids in private school, and they put them in this uh, 
private school that's a church out there. And, you know, um, my, uh, my family was, was really happy about this because we knew that uh, my niece and nephew were going to get, um, uh, you know, the education in a Christian environment and that maybe then that church would be able to reach my brother and his wife in a way that, that nobody has been able to before. And so he was telling me that one day he drove to school to pick up his kids and there was a, a woman out there uh, handing out flyers for a church event. And she very enthusiastically and sincerely invited him and his family to come to this church event. And he took the flyer and he thought, oh, you know, that sounds kind of nice. You know, maybe we'll come. So then he went in and he, he picked up his kids and uh, got all their stuff together and everything and went out and he got into his car and he backed out of the spot and he accidentally went down the wrong way of that uh, aisle of the parking lot. You know, if the arrow was pointing this way, he was ac accidentally was driving this way. And there was another uh, lady who was coming up this way, and she was very upset that he was going in the wrong direction. And so she stuck her uh, head out the window, and she was yelling and kind of uh, cursing him out for going the wrong direction. And guess who it was? The same woman who enthusiastically and sincerely invited him to come to this church event. And he was telling me this story because he said, you know, this is why I don't go to church that this lady who was uh, pretending to care about me and coming to this event then all of a sudden just because I was going the right, wrong way cursed me out. And what she was really saying to him was that you are not following the rules and that is what is most important to me. You are not following the rules and that is what's most important to me. Now, that doesn't just happen outside the church in the parking lot. It also happens inside the church. And I have two examples of things like this happening um, that uh, once in, in a church there was a, a young lady who was probably in her late teens and, and she came in uh, to a worship service for the first time and there was uh, another lady who had been going to that church for a long time that came up to her and really kind of chastised her for her dress and she said what you're wearing is not appropriate for worshiping God and uh, you need to dress uh, more modestly or whatever it was and so because of that this this you know 18 or 19 year old girl who had come into worship for the first time just said okay well if I'm if I'm, you don't want me here I'll leave or if you don't if I am not supposed to be here I'll leave and she didn't come back and it was because what the woman was actually telling her was you are not following the rules and that's what's most important to me Another instance was uh, a young lady, probably even younger um, than 18 or 19, came in and she was uh, carrying a baby and um, there was a, uh, another church member that had been there a long time that came up to her and said, um, you know, hey, uh, are you new here? And yes, and oh, oh where's your husband? And she said, well, you know, I'm not married. I um, uh, have my, my daughter with uh, my boyfriend who's not in the picture anymore. And then that church member proceeded to lecture her about her bad choices. Somebody who she didn't even know before she was even told that God loved her or welcomed her into the, into the worship service, they were lecturing her because of her choices. And really what that person was saying to her was, you are not following the rules, and that's what is most important to me. Now, before you say, well, I'm glad Trinity isn't like all these other churches. Those last two stories happened right here. You are not following the rules, and that is what is most important to me. Is that the message that we want to give to people who walk in our doors? Or is it that following Jesus is about loving you just the way that you are and bringing you along in your walk with Christ? You know, there, there does come a time when we do want to uh, talk to somebody about their, their things in their lives that might be um, getting in the way of their walk with God. And we might want to say, you know, I think that this uh, choice that you've made or that choice that you've made isn't the best for, for um, your walk with Jesus and is, is really not what he wants for you. But in order to have that conversation, they need to be 100% convinced that, first of all, you love them just the way that you are, and so does God. And so those kind of talks happen in the context of a relationship where that loving acceptance has already been established. And what you're not saying is that you aren't following the rules, so you can't be here, or that you shouldn't be here, or that God thinks less of you, or that I don't like you, or whatever that might be saying. 
What you are saying is you're making choices that are not good for you, and because I love you, I would love to come alongside you and, and uh, help you with that. But that has to happen in the context of first unaccept, or uh, for a love that is unconditional. So, you know, um, as, we, as we go along in this worship discussion, uh, you know, as we're talking about maybe possible changes to our Sunday morning schedule, I've had, some, I've had some great discussions with people on that. I really appreciate all the feedback that I'm getting. I'm loving the emails. I mean, I have good discussion, really, uh, and the phone calls. And um, I am convinced that the Lord is going to lead us in this process, and we're not going to do anything until uh, we have a consensus as to in what direction that we should go, and that the Lord's going to reassure all of us that, um, that He is in this decision and in this process. And I'm convinced of that, and I thank you uh, for, for uh, playing your part in that discussion. But I've also, uh, as part of those discussions, have heard things like, well, worship has to include the benediction every week, or lose... Worship has to include the creed every week, or, or uh, worship has to be um, around tables with a band, or worship has to be uh, at pews with an organ, or worship has to be uh, out of the, the hymnal, and, and worship has to be this or that. And, you know, I just caution people, you know, we are not three different churches. We are one body of Christ. Here in this place, we are one congregation. We are not a, a church that worships at 8 and another church that worships at 9.30 and another church that worships at 11. And so, first and foremost, you know, all those things might be good. The worshiping around tables and with the band and with the organ and with the hymnal and with the, the creed and, all, and with the benediction, those are, you know, good things. But what we have to be about first and foremost is following Jesus together. Following Jesus together as one church not three different churches who are saying, well, this is what I want or this is what I want. Now, and I don't think that we're doing that. I, I just want to remind everyone as we, as we make up a list of what worship has to be, that following those rules is not what following Jesus is about, but instead it is about being unified as the body of Christ and worshiping him together. But there's good news. Good news. That is that following Jesus is way better than following the rules. So if you've been trying to follow the rules and either ending up pretending to be someone you're not or being in despair because you know you're not doing it well or because you're failing at being perfect or even good, then know that following Jesus is better than following the rules. Way better because we have in following Jesus hope instead of despair. Let me just tell you a little bit more about Luther. So then when he gets back from his trip from Rome, and uh, he is in even more despair than when he left because of the shape that he found it in and the hypocrisy that he found there, and he dives into the, the scripture, what does he find there? He finds hope. Hope in Jesus Christ. That following Jesus is not about following a list of rules, but it's about having a relationship with him. It's about putting people and God before anything else. Following Jesus gives us hope and not despair. And so there is hope certainly for us too as we go to God's word. Maybe in our despair, maybe as we struggle with uh, different sin in our lives, as we're um, not able to, to follow the rules as, as good as um, uh, we think uh, we should or as, as good as we want to and um, you know we we put on a, a righteous face when we get to church so that nobody else knows that anything's wrong and and then uh, we go home and we we pray to God that that he would help us um, through this and you know that's not the way that Christians were meant to live that's not the way that the church was meant to be you know there's um, uh, the church is supposed to be genuine and not um, hypocritical right so a, a real church versus a fake church. What is a real church versus a fake church? Well, a fake church is if you go and everybody pretends that they've got everything all together and nobody wants to say, well, wait, I don't, because then they think that everybody else does and then they'll be judged for not having it all together when really everybody knows that we don't have it all together. So that's what a fake church looks like. A real church looks like me being able to say, I don't have it all together and I'm not going to judge you for not having it all together, so let's strengthen and be honest and open with each other about our failings and faults that we might then together be strengthened and follow Jesus. 
So, it's to say that I am a sinner so that you can come to me knowing that I'm not going to judge you for being one. So, I'll start with myself then. If anybody out there is thinking, you know, I'd love to go talk to Pastor about this problem that I'm having, but, uh, you know, he looks like he's got it all together and he'll just think that, uh, that I'm a, a terrible person or something like that, well, let me reassure you of something. I don't have it all together. I'll go ahead and get that off the table right now. And since I am a sinner, I am certainly not going to judge you for being one. And first and foremost, I need to be open and non-judgmental to care for my sheep in a way that's real and that you know that you don't have to put on a phony face with me to make me think that you've got it all together. Then, as we begin to be more open with each other about that, then I don't feel like I have to be that way with you. You don't feel like you have to be that way with me. We could say to each other, I am a sinner, so I'm not going to judge you for being one. You know, there was a, I, I, I've talked about this before, but there's, um, there's a, let me just uh, switch the slide here for, give me the slide, there we go. I'm going to put that up for just a second, but then I'm going to let you uh, think about a question that this, this a woman asked me, and I've, I've thrown this question out to you before, but I think about it a lot. I think about it a lot, and that is that um, I, I was talking with a woman who was uh, a lesbian, and she had a live-in partner, and she asked me this question. Would I be welcome at your church? Because I was, you know, telling her, come in and, and, and worship with us. Um, these are our service times. We'd love to have you. And she, she said, well, you know, I, I would like to go. But would I be welcome at your church? And my answer to her was, I hope so. I hope that you would be welcome because um, you're no worse of a sinner than anyone else who worships at our church. So I would hope that you would come and receive the forgiveness that God has and be welcomed and embraced as a part of our family of faith. And, you know, that only happens if we are a church who puts people and God above following the rules. So... You know, that doesn't mean, again, that you can't come alongside people and, and help them uh, to make good choices in their faith. But first and foremost, we welcome people and accept them as they are, just as Christ does. So, the verse that we've got here in this picture of the lighthouse, you know, this is, this is a different picture than the one Jesus paints of the tombs, right? The whitewashed tombs that are, that are clean and, and pretty on the outside, but dead on the inside. That this is a picture of what it means to be drawn into the light of Jesus. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. You know, light brings people out of darkness, warts and all. Light brings people out of darkness, sin and all. So if people can't come into the light here, where can they? So my prayer then for this community is that we would be a church who welcomes people as they are, who accepts people as they are, who any one of us right now could come up to this podium and share with the entire group their intimate struggles with their faith and that they could go and sit down and that we would not feel or think any less of them than we did before they got up and that we could then surround them as a community of faith and strengthen and uplift them according to the way that they need. That is my prayer for this community, that we would be about following Jesus and not following the rules. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me offer a prayer. Dear Lord God, uh, we know that you have given us the law for our own protection, for our own well-being, but sometimes we pervert that law into something that becomes a replacement for our faith. That we begin to follow them instead of following you, Lord. And we know that sometimes in our lives that leaves us in despair as we wrestle with the reality that you tell us that we are not perfect people. And sometimes that leads us to being hypocrites or fakes as we then pretend that we are more righteous than we are instead of being open and honest with you and with your church. We pray that you would 
help us to put you and loving other people before the rules, Lord, that you would help us to accept ourselves as we are, as you do, to remind ourselves that you love us even in our failings, that you forgive us through your son, Jesus. Help us to accept others as they come into your church and into our midst just as you do as well. Warts and all, help us to follow you. Help us to follow the light so that we may bring all that we are and all that we do into the light and that we might encourage and uplift one another. Lord God, we pray that you would continue to be with our discussion regarding our uh, worship options and challenges that we have. Please instill in each of us just the, the certain hope that you are leading us and that you will bring us together through this discussion and that the result will end up unifying us as a church and putting us on the path that you would have us be on, following your son first and foremost. We ask that you would be with all those uh, in our midst who are hurting or struggling or are in need of your care and your mercy, and we ask that you would help us to be instruments of that mercy and care. We pray that you would grant continued healing to Jerry Gamble, who was uh, released from the hospital after stroke symptoms, but is still in need of your healing. We ask for your prayers for also Peter Mooney, who has now been transferred to a hospital in Miami, and, and be with the doctors as they continue to struggle to care for him, Lord, that we pray that you would uh, grant him healing and uh, grant him a sense of, of your presence that he is in your hands, Lord. We ask for your continued healing mercy for Doug Preston, who is recovering from surgery, and we thank you for all of those places where you have restored your people here and, and healed us according to your mercy. We also ask, Lord, that you would be with um, Jamie Wagner as he has received a call to serve as a principal at another church. And Lord, we pray that you would grant him wisdom in this process, that he might go where he is most needed. But at the same time, Lord, we also pray that you would continue to have a place for him here in Trinity's ministry. And we ask that you would just guide him in his process. And Lord God, we just pray that you uh, be with all the ministries of Trinity and, and also our, our beach picnic that's later today, that we might come together as a family of faith and, and have some fun and get to know each other better. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, ask that you please pray with me the prayer that, uh, that Jesus has taught us when his disciples asked, Lord, how should we pray? He has given us this as an example that is really all inclusive of anything that we would ever need from God. And so as we pray this, we are we're reminded that uh, he knows what we need even before we ask or even more than we do. So um, if you would, uh, uh, please stand and let's pray this together. And we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven and give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen and receive the blessing of the, our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.